Now we're continuing with Rolf. He's an, a, professor of, uh, a professor at the University of Applied Sciences in Augsburg and also co-hosting the German uh, podcast, German language podcast, Neulich im Netz. And today he'll talk about the uh, endeavor to find a way to find the way back to us. So for a reverse trace route. Give a warm welcome to Rolf. All right, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about um, designing reverse trace route, which is something you cannot have yet. But uh, I hope that uh, sometime in the future that's something we can all rely on. Um, I, I am working for the University of Applied Sciences Augsburg. I am a co-host of an internet technology podcast, but I'm also um, co-founder of Contact, which is helping people to get online and troubleshooting problems. And troubleshooting is something I want to talk about. But this work is something that I've been doing together with uh, Valentin Heinrich, and in fact, uh, he did most of the work. So you all know Traceroute. I'm not going to explain Traceroute to you. You know the exact details about it. You use it regularly. But um, Traceroute, and we talk about the public internet, not the, the bits of the internet that you have control over. Because there you can do whatever you want, but we talk about the public internet. And um, Traceroute is sometimes referred to as the number one go-to tool for troubleshooting problems on the internet. And that's a quote I took from a Nanoc talk, which is held semi-regularly um, at Nanoc, which is called A Practical Guide to Correctly Troubleshooting with Traceroute. And uh, I put a video link here that was Nanoc AD, where I think it was um, presented last time. And I know uh, you use Traceroute 2 regularly, and I picked this up from the um, Dinoc mailing list, and that was um, Thursday. And on Thursday, there was a mail going out and had uh, traceroute output in it. And it, it wasn't just Thursday, it happens all the time, and you know that. And um, the thread, if you want to look it up, is Hilfe bei Eingrenzung Packet Loss uh, zu DTAC. And um, there was um, a lot of discussion um, on that thread. Uh, you can look it up, it was quite interesting. But there's only two tools on the public internet that you really have. I mean, you have ping, and ping doesn't give you an awful lot of information. It gives you interface reachability. It gives you a round trip time, or well, let's call it measurement. And that's it. And then you have trace route. It gives you the same thing. Plus, it gives you um, the same thing for every hop towards that destination. So when the TTL expires at a router, it will measure the round trip time towards that router and will tell you that the router is there on the path from you towards that destination. That's what trace route is doing for you. And it appears simple, so when you look at the output, you, as experts, of course, know what's going on, and you make your conclusions. But um, I refer to this talk at Nanoc where, um, well, correctly there is in, in brackets, and sometimes hard to interpret what you're actually seeing. So you really need to know what's going on. And this talk is not about trace route, it's about some work we did, it's about an implementation we did, and it's about something we have submitted to the IETF um, for consideration so you can um, Look it up. It's the it's basically the protocol that we are I'm standardizing, and I'm I'm trying not to talk about too much about the protocol details today, but more about the operation and uh, a call to action at the end. Please consider yourself as customers of this work, um, because you might use it hopefully in the future. But in principle, every internet citizen should be able to use this uh, at some point in the future once it's standardized and implemented. <clears throat> so here's a an obviously fake <laughs> excerpt from Traceroute. So you suspect a problem somewhere, uh, such as the person on the DNOC mailing list, you run a Traceroute and you see things, and then you start analyzing it and draw your conclusion. So here we have um, a, it's fake, of course, but this is something you would see from a regular Traceroute, um, the, the same way it comes from with Linux or Mac OS. And you have IP addresses, and normally IP addresses aren't all that helpful. Um, for us humans at least. And then uh, you have router names, and router names are, are great. Um, thanks for that, because uh, you said those names, and they're very expressive. Most of the time, they have location data in there, or interface specifications, and things like that. That is very helpful. And when we look at this trace route output, we see <clears throat> this packet goes from Augsburg to Munich, um, stays in Frankfurt for some time, and then let's assume for the sake of argument today that example.com is in Frankfurt as well. And then it gives you, typically Traceroute sends out three packets per hop and then gives you a round trip time estimate. And you see that, well, uh, things are looking good up until the point it hits Frankfurt. And there's clearly something happening in Frankfurt and it's probably between network A and network B because the uh, domain name changes there and goes up from 11 seconds 
a minimum to something like 300, uh, 320 milliseconds, and that for an inter-Frankfurt link doesn't seem right. And it's not that the router is sluggish or it responds to ICMP messages or to, to uh, trace route messages um, slowly, because that is something you might expect, because it persists. So if, it, if it's being forwarded to example.com, you still see high latency. So it's on the forwarding path as well. So you might draw conclusions like, <clears throat> I run a network like this. <laughs> this is normal. Yeah, there's nothing to worry about. Um, maybe you say there's something between routers um, C and D, so that's hops three and four in this output, because that's clearly something that's within Frankfurt and that shouldn't add 300 milliseconds of delay there. Or you might say, you can't really tell given the output alone. I need more information. So let's look at this particular example. So this is what you see in traceroute. So you see a path going from the client to the, to the web server, passing through a couple of routers. So packets from the client to the web server go along those, this path. And as I said, you might suspect there's something wrong between network A and network B. Um, and on the DNOC mailing list, somebody expected just that. But when you look at the answers that, for example, come from, from the web server, it hits router D, and now uh, network B decides, hmm, Network A is too expensive or uh, we don't like them. For some reason, they're not picking them for the reverse path. They're picking an alternate route. So the, the route towards of the return packets, the ICMP time exceeded messages, they take a different path through the network. And that is typical. There's nothing unusual. The internet is highly asymmetric. There are studies about this. And in an um, asymmetric internet, that is something you clearly expect. You don't see that in your trace route output. So when you um, add a, an error or um, a problem anywhere along the reverse path, this will be consistent with what you see in the reverse uh, in the in the trace route output here. So let's add a problem here, and that is exactly what you would see in trace route, right? So within network A up to router C, you'll have a symmetric route. It goes through. Obviously, the, the answers go through A's network. It stays within the network. But once you hit router D, you take a different path towards the client. And if the problems are on the reverse path, you simply don't see that. It's invisible to you just by using traceroute alone. <clears throat> so remember that mail I, I talked about? Here's the exact quote. I'm sorry, it's in German, but it's a quote. Hat jemand von euch einen DTEC-Anschluss und könnte den umgekehrten Weg zu I, I, anonymized the IP address malprüfen, which translates to, does anybody amongst you have a DTEC internet connection and could check the return path for me? Because that person knows, uh, I, I assume that person knows. <laughs> um, if you're in this room, you can always correct me, but I assume this person knows that um, the traceable output alone won't give them ground truth. There's something clearly wrong, and this person has experienced something going wrong, and it suspects something, and it suspects a, a certain link between two providers, but it can't really tell from trace route output alone. People did that, so that is a nice thing. People did that, right? So the Dino community is very nice, and they're very helpful, and um, people did just that. But it's 2020, and maybe <laughs> we can have a tool for this and don't have to use a mailing list for it. So our goal with this work is really to de design a reverse trace route, so you get the, 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 ace, the potentially asymmetric backward path, and we want to implement it too, and at some point we hope this is as ubiquitously available as this ping and trace route. So a, a facility for the public internet for all of us. So as I said, it's 2020, so you might think, well, I can't be the first person to think about this problem. And it's something commonplace on the internet. So somebody must have thought about this, and that's correct. So there's RFC 1339, that's the earliest I found, um, from 1993. That's nearly 30 years ago. Somebody wrote this up. And um, since then, it's been deprecated. So it's deprecated for, for I think, 10 years now. But what they did was they um, invented, so IPv6 didn't exist yet, so they invented an IPv4 option, or they specified an IPv4 option. And what happens is you, you take a regular data packet, you add the option, and when a router sees that option, so you write your origin address, your source IP address into that option. And um, I, I tell you why um, later on. So there, you, you write your source IP address into that option, a router sees that packet with that option, 
forwards it as usual, as a usual data packet, but uses the IP address in that option to send a reply back. And this way, a data packet goes through the network and every router seeing the option just sends a reply back and this way you can um, do, the, do a, a trace route measurement. Now, reverse trace route works the same way. Um, the, the target host sends a normal data packet back. It would add the same IP option with the same IP address, so with the originator, and then every router seeing that will send a special message back, and this way you also get the reverse path. So that was 1993. You might wonder, why don't we have that yet? <laughs> we have a little bit of IPv6. IPv6 is better. We have a little bit of that, but we don't have that at all, and there's reasons. So <clears throat> you need router support, and there's router vendors in the room, and if you ask them to implement something for you, they probably say no. Um, without knowing what it actually is that you want, but they probably say no. Um, and it's hard to get things into a router if you're not a router vendor and you're not convinced and there's no money involved in this. And they used IP options and IP options are their IP options. Um, there's also, you could spoof the originator's IP address really easily. You can write any IP address in there and that kind of smells like amplification attack, right? If you can make packets go to any place you want by set, setting an IP address in a packet, in an option even, um, that sounds, that's much funny. Um, but what it does, it teaches us to be very careful with protocol design and the design choices we make. And we try to do this better. Oh, yeah, and uh, it was obsolete exactly 10 years ago. So don't expect this to appear anytime soon. So we, we sat down and uh, formulated a number of design goals that we wanted to achieve to get reverse trace route on the road at some point in time. So the first thing is we, we can't expect control of the, of the host, of the remote host. And that's the same with ping and trace route today. So you don't control the host that is sending the echo response. You don't control the host that you do a trace route towards. You have no control. It's somewhere sitting in the operating system. It's implemented. It's there. So it smells like you need a standard and you probably need to do something with ICMP too. It should be safe to use. So you shouldn't create something that is um, basically a tool for DDoS attacks or amplification attacks that sounds <laughs> it sounds easy to do, but it's, it's a bit more work. So um, uh, I'll show you later when, when we see the, the, the protocol interactions. It should be deployable on the internet today. It would be nice if it works today without waiting another 20 years for it uh, to be ubiquitously um, available. And it should be policeable. And I thought we, this is important for, for you folks in particular, because you want to control what's going into your network, what leaves your network and uh, you might want to switch this off. So there should be something in the header that makes it easily identifiable as being part of a reverse trace route. That should be something that's important to us. Not done yet. <laughs> so um, we're aware of load balancing, and you see this in trace route, right? Sometimes you have different IP addresses for the same hop, and then um, that's load balancing in action. And we know it's there, and we know how routers do the load balancing. So sometimes you want to control the packets that go out so they stay on the same load balanced path. So it's the four tuple for a, um, for a TCP packet or something in an ICMP header that routers use to load balance. We want to make this controllable in a way that you can, so the, the trace route packets can stay on, on a single path, on a single load balance path. Um, we call this no hackery, and this is up for arguments. So we put it there because there have been other attempts that I have not shown you, and they use things like IP address, source address, IP address spoofing. And there's people in the room that combat this every day, and uh, other people proposing it as a mechanism for <laughs> reverse trace route. And we thought, well, maybe not, right? Maybe that's not good. Or um, IP options, a lot of you have firewalls in place that would strip IP options from packets for reasons. So, we don't want to use things that are uncommon on the public internet, let's put it this way. I talked about that, and I don't want to talk to router vendors um, telling me no. <laughs> and uh, another interesting thing would be Mimic and Trace Route in two senses. So it should give you the same amount of information that the regular Trace Route gives you for the forward path. So that's RTT measurements and every router between your target and yourself on the reverse path. 
and it should, on, the, on a packet level, look the same. So if trace route works for you today, the reverse trace route should work for you today too, just for the probing bit. So sending packets that expire at a router somewhere. So these are our design goals. Now I'm going to show you how our design actually looks like. So this is our network again, and the blue path is now the one we are interested in. That's the reverse path. And what we do is we send out an ICMP request to the target. So this would be the client sends an ICMP request to www.example.com asking for a reverse trace route. And we use ICMP because this way the likelihood of it being implemented in operating systems and just sitting there and being readily available for us to use is maximized. So it's nothing in the application layer. You don't want to start a process somewhere and then listening for something. We want, to be, uh, it, we want it to be shipped with operating systems. So ICMP is probably the thing to do. And it's easily policeable too. So a lot of you rightfully or not rightfully so police ICMP at your network border. And if you don't want to have reverse trace route, you can still police those packets pretty easily. In order for it not to become a, a DDoS attack tool, um, you can't just send one packet there and it will do a full trace route for you and send you the result. That, <laughs> you can't do that. So you have to make the client do some work. For every packet that www.example.com will send, the client needs to send a packet too. So make the client do some work in order for it to be, well, symmetric in work. So if you want to use it as an attack tool, well, do the attack yourself because it's the same amount of work. It's, this, it's roughly the same amount of traffic. That's what uh, drove our design. So the first thing that's happened is um, an ICMP packet will travel from the client towards the target asking for a single probe to be sent out. So one packet for one TTL value. Now, the, the target, www.example.com, will do just that. And you as a client, you can ask for the probe to be either UDP, ICMP, or TCP. That's basically something you can do with TraceRoute today, too. You do send a TCP SYN packet. Well, most use UDP packets for that. Um, and ICMP packets are being supported by most tools, too. And reverse trace route allows you to do that. And I'm not going to go into details, but you can fiddle with some of the values inside the probe so you can control load balancing too. Right, so if the host has reverse trace route implemented, it will send out one packet, in this example here with TTL2, get the ICMP time exceeded response from the router back. A single packet is emitted. And finally, it has to be reported back. So this is being reported back to the client using an ICMP response with the uh, round trip time estimate and the IP address of the router, of the interface where the, where the packet expired. And it goes over the reverse path, obviously. So this is the, the protocol exchange. It's nothing fancy. Um, there's a lot of details in the, in the draft, and we, we're about to publish a paper about this. There's a lot of um, details about uh, the protocol machinery and why we chose certain designs. It's not as clear cut. And I'm going to show you two examples of why it's not so clear cut. I haven't seen, I don't think I've seen a, a protocol header these two days. I've seen a lot of configs. I'm sorry, I'm not going to show you any configs. <laughs> um, but um, I, I'll have to show you one, one header, unfortunately. So um, we designed it for ICMP v4 and v6 uh, because it's 2022. And most ICMP messages start like this. They have a type and a code. And the type and the code tells you what kind of message is that. For, for example, a ping request, an echo request, would have 8-0 here. And the response would have 0, zero in that. And the question we ask ourselves is, which type and code to use? It seems like a simple enough question. So you go to the registry, see which one is still available, pick the Pick one, um, preferably the, the smallest one that's available, maybe. Or what you could do, you could take an existing type and use a different code. Why not? I mean, you can multiplex on the code alone. But the real question behind this is, which one works on today's internet? Right? So we said one of our design goals is deployability. We want to have it run on the public internet today. Which one would work on the public internet? So the problem with 
today's internet is middle boxes. Some of you run middle boxes. I'm not blaming you. you, you. <laughs> Your line manager makes you doing that. But the most common middle box today on the public internet are nets. Most of us are behind the net when we're at home. Um, and they ossify the internet because a net believes it knows how the internet works. And that means when the internet changes, it doesn't work anymore because it's outside of this picture of the internet that the net believes the internet should look like. So we tested, um, the question was, does it go through nets? That's one of the big questions we had. We tested 12 net implementations. And what we did was we sent basically two packets with type 8. Type 8 was ping. And we knew, used codes that, aren't, that are still available inside of ping. So type 8, only code 0 is being standardized for ping. And what we do is kind of like ping, right? We, we say, send me a packet back, and that's what the, the other end will do. And if the TTL is high enough, we actually get one packet back. So it's a reverse ping, if you wish. So we use that and new two, type, uh, new two codes, one and two. And as I said, standard ping uses zero. And then we picked two unassigned types, the uh, slow, uh, smallest one and a really big one with, type, uh, with code zero. And the question is, will it go through those NAT implementations? Here's the result. Type 8, <coughs> code 1, so it's the echo type with a new code. 11 of those 12 boxes just forward them. And the result is also forwarded. It just goes through. It works. And, most net imp oh, and the net implementations are um, home routers, basically. One filtered um, the response, but most of them just, it just worked on today's internet on, with the net implementations we tested. Um, a new type worked in one of those net implementations. And um, filtered means the, the response doesn't go out. So from your home network to the public internet, the box decides, I don't know this. I'm going to drop this. It doesn't make it uh, into the internet. Bypass is interesting. So there's actually a lot of net boxes. What they would do is they say, oh, I don't know this. Let's not translate the source IP address and just send it out. <laughs> so they send out packets with a private IP source address, and that seems to be acceptable for actually quite a lot of middle box vendors out there. <laughs> right. I, I can, I, I don't, well, they're in my lab, but I, I won't shame them yet. <clears throat> <laughs> So this is kind of cute, right? Oh, you tested 12 nets. Um, what happens with those packets on the internet, on the public internet? So what we did was we picked um, 10 million IPv4 addresses at random. We didn't pick IPv6 addresses at random because the chance of somebody sitting there and listening is really, really slow. Uh, low. Um, so we picked IPv4. And we sent an ICMP echo, just a regular ping. And if we get a response, we do something else with them. And we did that because, you know, if, if, if this is a host that is online and everything ICMP is filtered, there's no use. It's not an interesting question to answer. Oh, ping is filtered, so everything else is obviously also filtered. So every, everybody that replied to an ICMP echo also got an ICMP echo type and a code one packet right after. So this has not been specified. But how do hosts on the internet react to that? So here's the result. <laughs> uh, out of those 10 million, a little more than a million actually answered to our ping. 40,000, roughly 40,000 filtered it, so we didn't get a response back. We sent, sent multiple, so somewhere along the path, it, we don't know why, but it, uh, um, they replied to an echo request, but they didn't reply to this. Um, some replied with <laughs> something completely different, and that's the Aramis, uh, mostly destination and reachable packets were, were sent. Um, and then we have two categories, one is reflective, one is unreflective. Reflective means we get an echo response back with code one. Most of hosts on the internet react like this. So you send them an echo request with a code that has not been specified yet. They send an echo response, so um, type zero, code one. 
they just reflect it and say, okay, we, we got this from you, uh, and we believe this is the correct answer. And this is nice, it's actually, it's, it's green for a reason. Uh, this is good for us because that means it works on the, on the public internet. It made its way there, right? It was reflected, so this is exactly what we send because there, there might be a middle box in between that, that scrubs the code and puts a zero in there so we don't know. And unreflected means we, we just get a regular echo response back. But for most of the internet, those packets actually make it to the other end. And that's a good result. Well, it's good if you care about deployability, at least. All right, so there's a lot more detail and there's a lot of things that uh, we needed to, to consider, at least, um, for going through the standardization process. We're not there yet. I mean, this is, has just been published a couple of uh, weeks ago, and we'll do a, a, another round of revisions pretty soon. But um, the reason why I'm here is actually a call for action, so you should actually do something. Uh, of course, you can ask questions later on, but what uh, we would like you to do is to join the discussion on the inter-area working group uh, mailing list if this is useful to you and express that. If that is useful for you, tell them, and that will um, generate interest. Another thing, I've seen a lot of company badges while I was here. I saw like Cloudflare and Fastly and, and Akamai and a bunch of others that have presences all over the planet. And if you could offer to host a reverse trace route endpoint for us, because we want to play with this now and want to see how the public internet reacts, how it, how it actually works, um, that would be really nice. So if any of you <coughs> have a Linux machine somewhere and uh, if it's far away, even better. The further away from Germany, the better. So we get better paths and more path diversity and uh, more endpoints. But it, also if it's in Germany, we're happy to, to instruct you um, how to install the reverse trace route endpoint. It's a small eBPF program. So we heard eBPF before. It's a small eBPF program. If you could host that, that would be lovely. If you don't want to host a probe, and that's understandable, um, then it would be nice if you could run the client for us. So the client is just a small Python program that sends out those packets um, because we host the public reverse trace route endpoint. Whenever you are at a conference, at a hotel, at an airport, anywhere, please run our tool and send, out, uh, send us the output. So there's a switch in there that does that automatically. You don't have to open your email program or anything. It, it will do that automatically, but that would be nice. Um, it would be very valuable for us because now we, we're at the point where we need more data. We did the protocol design, now we need data. <laughs> so we have 12 nets in our lab. We would like to test more um, and we have, so far we are only testing home gateways. If you have an old home gateway lying around that you would otherwise throw away, you know, sustainability and things like that we talked about, we would recycle them for research purposes. <laughs> <laughs> um, to see how those nets are actually um, behaving. If you have some and you can spare them and you can mail them to us, that would be nice. Um, also, if you have a, a DSLAM or an MZAN or a CMTS that's old and lying around somewhere, that would also be appreciated if you can send one of those. Um, right. Here's the website where we link all the information that is there. Here's the GitHub. It's empty at this point in time because we clean up the code for you. Because some of you can code, and then it would be embarrassing if it's not <laughs> up to your standard. We talked about standards, so <laughs> if it's not up to your standard, we're not going to publish it before we believe it's up to your standard, which is probably in the next couple of days. And uh, if you have uh, questions or want to send me a NAT implementation or a CMTS or something, then you can reach out to me via this email. And now I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. Firstly, firstly, thank you for your talk. And I've already seen there's at least two questions in the room here. Hi, uh, Frank's my name. Um, I, throughout the talk, I was thinking, what about looking glasses? Mm -hmm. Could they help you, or why, why, why not looking glasses? So, right, so there's a very limited amount of looking glasses, and they are at very special points in the network, usually. And you could use them too, and there's also websites. I mean, there's websites that, that allow you to, to do a trace route, right? But even DNOC folks are using the email list to ask for that. So it would be really nice if this is a facility that's basically embedded in every operating system on the planet, and then 
you, you don't pick certain places, you pick the places that you are interested in. Because at that point in time, somebody was interested in, in DTAC, and then you can pick a place that is suitable for your troubleshooting needs. So okay. You for your uh, sorry, in, in internet question. How do you how do you handle if a router won't respond to ICMP correctly, because um, it doesn't prioritize ICMP responding and um, is under load uh, doing mm -hmm. routing? And right. With such design, wouldn't it be exacerbate uh, the situation? So. We don't handle it because we can't. Um, and the same is true for Traceroute today. So you can't, if, if, a, if a router's busy, or a lot of routers, I mean, you configure those boxes. You tell me. A lot of you probably uh, rate limit ICMP time exceeded messages um, on your boxes because you're afraid of just that. And we, 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 can't, we can't handle that. But uh, um, it's just the same way. You have the same problem today with regular Traceroute, and we can't fix that. Or we have to ask a, a router vendor to fix that, but um, you know router vendors. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, very interesting th uh, thing. Uh, have you thought about talking with the RIPE? Uh, maybe get this implemented on the uh, Atlas probes? That would be awesome. So if, if the RIPE, is the RIPE person here that is, that is doing something with Atlas? Shame on them. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, um, they usually are around, so... Yeah, but that's a good point. But, um, so I, I think they're very cautious about what they actually put on those probes. Uh, very, very cautious for very, very good reasons, because there's a lot of probes out there. But uh, that's a good... Uh, we, we try to reach out to them. Maybe they can do one or two probes for us. Yes, the same question is basically also for the NL knock ring. So, right, Atlas. Right, 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 right. Thanks, okay. Carsten. Um, I just wonder, as you said, uh, there is a Python implementation for the client side. Yeah. And uh, given what you just said about uh, the Atlas probes, be careful and, and, and stuff, I just wonder whether there's any plans to have the client side also implemented on, on the two main platforms for uh, mobile communication. So ah. that, uh, because that possibly would give you quite a big footprint and yes. would increase traction quite heavily. That would be awesome. Say. The problem is, on those pla they are very restricted platforms, and just sending ICMP packets with codes that haven't been, haven't been uh, assigned yet, I think is, is technically impossible, unless they're rooted. So we can't put it in the, in the Play Stores because we don't have access this deep into the system. So okay. I just wonder, at least for one, there's alternative uh, uh, Play Stores or App Stores. Uh, right. So possibly f might be an option um, yeah. where you potentially... Yeah, that's a good point. Ah, okay, I see. Yeah. Okay, okay, so one question for me. Um, well, a trace route uh, in some implementations is not using ICMP, but UDP. Most uh, actually are using UDP. Yes, uh, actually, but um, your talk was referring to ICMP, and that's quite clever. But how about extending that to TCP or UDP? Because sometimes you want to have the trace for a flow and not for ICMP. That's correct. So actually... I'm Sorry, we need, to we need to cut because we're already having the next talk. The short answer is it's there. We, we did it. So it's only the request is ICMP, and then the, the probe itself is either TCP, uh, TCP UDP, or ICMP. Thank you. Um, just one uh, quick comment um, on the last question regarding mobile app. Um, I guess many of us have uh, notebooks with an LTE or 5G client. So uh, maybe we can run the Python client uh, using a 5G connection. Oh, excellent. Our Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your talk.